Hello and welcome to the Extra Dogma post lecture, which will thread together long non-coding RNAs for X inactivation in the context of what we call dynamical systems theory, a branch of applied mathematics that's used to evaluate the short and long-term behavior of systems of differential equations describing rates of change with respect to time. Last time in class, you were introduced to two long non-coding RNAs that are expressed on opposite and overlapping strands of the X chromosome. Xist is the long non-coding RNA that enforces the inactive X state, and T6 is an antisense long non-coding RNA that antagonizes the function of Xist and is expressed on the active X allele. Consequently, for each X chromosome, there are two outcomes the XI state, in which Xist is expressed and T6 is repressed, or the XA state, or active X state, where Xist is repressed and T6 is expressed. These two outcomes are definitively enforced, even though the choice of which X chromosome to inactivate is random. We seek to understand how Xist and T6 regulation might enforce one of two definitive outcomes triggered by a random initial choice. To do so, we must abstract the biology as a rate equation describing the dynamics of the Xi state as a function of time. We'll begin with a simple rate equation for X and activation as follows. We assume that the rate of X and activation per unit time is a function of the production rates of Xist and T6. If Xist is being made faster than T6, then an X chromosome will move toward the Xi state, positive rate of change per unit time. And the bigger the discrepancy between Xist and T6, the faster that transition to the Xi state will occur. From here, we need to specify how the long non-coding RNAs are made with respect to the state of Xi. Here what we'll do is make a couple of assumptions. We're going to assume that Xist is produced cooperatively. You've seen cooperativity in the setting of enzyme activities earlier in the semester. Here we're using cooperativity to describe the rate of production of Xist as a function of the Xi state. And we're going to further postulate that the Hill coefficient exponent of the terms in the Hill function uh, is 2, and I'll speak more about that in, in just a moment. Second, we're going to assume that T6 is produced linearly as a function of an active X over here on the right-hand side. So a little bit more on cooperative Hill functions, like the one on the left-hand side. These are commonly used to model transcriptional regulation where the Hill coefficient gives a hint about the number of cooperating enhancer sites for a gene or a long non-coding RNA. If there are more cooperating enhancer sites, cooperativity is increased. And the reason why we're picking a Hill coefficient here of 2 um, and a linear function of T6 is simply to um, make the mathematics and the derivations more straightforward. However, the same dynamical systems properties I'm going to show arise when both Xist and T6 are modeled cooperatively and when they're modeled cooperatively with Hill coefficients other than 2. Just the math gets a bit messier. To examine the outcomes of the rate equation that I just introduced, we need to solve the, for the steady state or steady states of the variable Xi, which is easily done by setting that rate equation to zero. If we set dx sub i dt to uh, zero, we then can solve for xi at the steady state, which I um, uh, annotate here as x bar uh, sub i. After this, it's simply algebra reconfiguring the equation to arrive at a um, polynomial that's set next to zero for which we can solve the roots. In this formalism, there are three solutions at steady state. The first one should be pretty obvious, x bar sub i equals zero, equals zero. And then the other two terms we arrive at by applying the quadratic formula for this right-hand term here. 
I want to emphasize that under the right conditions, which are specified down here, both roots of the application of the quadratic formula will give rise to solutions of x sub i greater than zero, meaning that they are physically realizable states. As long as this term within the quadratic is greater than zero and you don't have any imaginary terms. So you can solve for this and put uh, constraints on the uh, rate parameters for T6 and X6 that if this relationship uh, holds, we have the, the interesting scenario of uh, obtaining three steady states, all of which are phys physically realizable uh, within the, the dynamics of the, of the system. At this point, the notion of three steady states should be confusing because if you're following up to this point, there should only be two steady states, a fully and activated state where the x sub i variable is high and a fully activated state where the x sub i variable is low or zero. However, uh, however what we have not yet introduced is the concept that not all steady states are created equal. Uh, to, to introduce this concept, we're going to begin with a gravitational analogy and position on a hill. So, so we all know from physics, thermodynamically an object will favor the position on this hill of lowest potential energy, as shown here. In this position, an object will not undergo motion, and moreover, any perturbations as a function of position will unfavorably change the potential energy. If we move to the left or we move to the right, the potential energy increases, creating a restoring force that will move that object back to its original position. Kinetically, this position in the valley is, a, is called a stable steady state because small changes in x decrease the d negative u for potential energy dx. Now let's take another position, this time on the top of the hill. It's another stable, stable, it's another steady state because the gravitational force pushing down on the object is, a, is opposed perfectly by the hill itself. However, its properties with respect to perturbation in X are now quite different. A nudge in either direction will cause the object to move away from its initial position to one of lower potential energy. Here, small changes in X cause an increase in d minus u dx, rendering the, sta the steady state unstable. We can describe these properties of stable and unstable steady states mathematically if we define an f of x which describes the dynamical system at a steady state c. If we differentiate f as a function of x and then evaluate that, dif uh, that derivative at position c, if the rate of change of f of x as a function of x is greater than zero, it's defined to be an unstable steady state, which means the, the, uh, the system is being driven away from that steady state. Conversely, if df dx is less than zero, that's the equivalent of a restoring force moving that system back to the steady state from where it was originally perturbed. With these concepts, we can now circle back to our original three steady states for X and activation and evaluate their stability properties. To remind, we set this function here equal to zero, or on the right, solved for the roots, and these are the three uh, steady state solutions whose stability we would like to evaluate. We begin by defining that steady state function, which to remind, were the original rates of production of x cyst and t6, but now evaluated at steady state for x sub i. We then calculate the derivative of that function with respect to x bar sub i. Here we need to invoke the quotient rule from calculus of uh, low d high minus high d low divided by low squared 
to take the, uh, the derivative of the first term, and then the second term is a straightforward differentiation as shown on the right. This simplifies to the following equation now that we're going to evaluate at each of the steady states of x sub i. To do that, we're going to make an additional simplifying assumption and um, postulate that k sub t equals 0 0.4 and k sub x equals 1. The reason for putting concrete values on k sub t and k sub x is that these conveniently arrive at um, the non arrive the allow the non-zero steady states to arrive at nice round values for future substitution. If we put this at 0.4 and this at 1, we get two additional st steady states at 2 and at 0 0.5 to complement the steady state that we already talked about, which was at 0. From here, it's simply plug and chug. We take that uh, equation that was shown on the preceding slide, evaluated at x bar sub i equals 0. That simply equals negative kt, which is negative 0.4, less than 0. So x bar sub i at 0 is a stable steady state. If we take the largest uh, steady state here of uh, x bar sub i equals 2, we arrive at the same conclusion. It's a little bit more uh, algebra, but we substituting in, we get again a value that's less than 0 in a stable steady state. Where it gets interesting is with the intermediate steady state, that x at 0 0.5. We're here when we substitute terms and we calculate. Now we get a value that is greater than 0, implying that the x bar sub i at 0 0.5 is an unstable steady state. So for x in activation, we have an intermediate unstable steady state flanked by two stable steady states. We can examine this graphically by returning to the rate equation and breaking it down according to the competing influences of x cyst and t6. Steady states arise in this equation when x cyst production is completely balanced by t6 production, right? when these two subtracted from one another equal zero. This is equivalent to when, these, when the two curves intersect, the two curves for x cyst and t6 intersect on a rate of change versus xi plot depicted here. The green trace describes the rate of change of excess per unit, uh, the, the rate of production of excess per unit time, so this term here as a function of xi, and then the t6 production is similarly shown as a uh, line uh, whose slope is determined by k sub t. They're plotted relative to one another because when they're equal, when they, these two curves intersect, these are the steady states of the system. If we look at the lowest steady state, recall that's the x bar sub i equal to zero, if we nudge that steady state towards the realizable values to the right hand side, what we can see is that T6 production in purple is greater than the excess production in green, collectively pulling that xi state back towards the x bar sub i equals zero state, reinforcing the stability of that stable state. We see the same type of phenomenon to the right of the highest steady state with T6 exceeding x cyst and pulling back towards the high stable state. Where on the left hand side, by contrast, x cyst exceeds T6, which provides a reciprocal restoring force that pulls the system back to that highest steady state. It's at the intermediate state where we see something very different. Either to the left or to the right of this uh, steady state, there are imbalances in x cyst and T6 production that push the system away from the intermediate, stable, uh, intermediate steady states and toward one of the other two steady states. Therefore, if chromosomes are originally poised near this unstable steady state, small fluctuations in x cyst or T6 production, and these are small fluctuations all the way down to thermal or biological noise, will be sufficient to drive this system randomly, but to definitively to either the active state defined by low xi and 
uh, in this model, or the inactive state defined by high xi in this model. Under these conditions, xn activation falls into the category of what is called a bistable system, meaning two stable steady states. Bistable systems emerge repeatedly in cell and molecular biology. A couple of examples, for instance, cell differentiation, type of differentiation and activation that occurs in adaptive immune cells is an example of bistability. We also see bistability in what we call digital cell fate decisions. For instance, deciding to undergo a round of cell proliferation or not. The cell divides or it doesn't. Um, and so when those switches occur, um, it's often enforced by some form of biostability. We also see this in cell signaling. We covered cell signaling and second messengers, where often there would be a, a homeostatic pathway getting engaged to set a cell back to its resting state. These would be transient cell signals that get turned on or turned off. But occasionally one encounters biology where if the signal is strong enough for long enough, it can flip the cell into a sustained cell signaling state that doesn't flip off. This is uh, often enforced by some type of biostability in the signaling network architecture inside the cells. Much more complicated than the example that I walked through today, but the principles remain the same. And then finally, for those that are interested in um, forward engineering of, of biology, things along the lines of synthetic biology, bistable uh, circuits are routinely invoked to allow the design of um, biological systems that can serve the role of switches uh, or timers. And so you'll see these concepts of bistability arise in design applications. And then more broadly, if you're interested and inspired by this intersection of mathematical modeling and biology, I would urge you to look at systems biology as a field, uh, which is one that's a real strength within BME here at UVA. Thanks very much, and I hope that you've gained a deeper appreciation for how the architecture of long non-coding RNAs sets up a regulatory network that enforces the X and activation state presented in class.